Hi guys, Oliver here from Spitfire Audio. Welcome to something slightly different today. Uh, part of the composer team are going to discuss our recent compositions we've done for our spring sale campaign. So we're going to be sharing tips and tricks. We're going to dissect our scores and we're going to talk um, through our approaches of writing the piece. Something else very exciting. I've got uh, two new members of our in-house uh, composer team uh, with us here today. One of them is Dan Keen, who you might have known already, and the other one is the wonderful Lucy Treacher, um, whose first video we're going to see today. Hey guys, how are you doing? Hi Oli, good thanks, how are you? Yeah, good, 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 thank you. How are you Lucy? Welcome to the team. Thanks so much, lovely to join you. Uh, so we're here connected via Zoom, we're going to uh, look at each other's uh, score, listen to each other's score, talk a little bit about the collection, however if you want to have an in-depth look and information uh, about the collection please head over to the website and check the collection walkthroughs. Dan, why don't you explain what the Epic Collection is and uh, show us the trailer for it. Thanks Ollie. So the Epic Collection is Hans Zimmer Percussion, Albion One and eDNA Earth and as the name suggests it's about creating those epic blockbuster style scores. Think Tenet, Avengers, those films that are slightly otherworldly but have huge orchestras as Albion One does, a 109 piece orchestra. eDNA Earth has those tension beds, the momentum building pads and synths and then finally Hans Zimmer Percussion is well, it's just thunderous. So with all of that in mind, I've accompanied this short 35 second trailer, um, kind of using those libraries from the collection. And uh, this is what it sounds like. That's amazing, Dan. Um, do you want to take us through a little bit how you go on about uh, starting a composition like that? I was especially uh, curious because it's quite short and you have to cram in quite a lot of information in that, in that short period of time. And how, yeah, I think it's always interesting to compare workflows. So. Absolutely. So for me, I started with the percussion mainly. Um, and so if I just solo this percussion here... Basically, as it goes on, it just gets bigger and bigger. And I think that's one of the things I kind of struggled with when I started writing this was not going too big too soon on it. You know, it's sort of you've got to build up with those little sub drops and things like that to kind of suggest that there's something kind of foreboding that's coming later. And then gradually as the piece goes on, I'm just kind of layering up more and more things. I actually started uh, with these hypertoms, just little kind of accented notes alongside the Tycho's. And then as the Tycho's, more Tycho's come in later, um, it sort of has this kind of a drum beat kind of style. It's sort of inspired by Tenet using sort of typical drum beats, I suppose, but in a more kind of orchestral sound. It sounds a little bit kind of metal sounding. Um, but the thing I kind of struggled with when I started writing this trailer was not building up too quickly. So in a lot of cases, I've actually uh, had to strip stuff back because it was just a little bit too much. You want to suggest that there's a bit of kind of foreboding coming later, um, but I guess you don't want to let everything out of the bag right from the beginning. Dan, how did you work with the rhythm of the images in that sense? I mean, as you were starting with the percussion, how conscious were you of hitting certain cuts and things like this so the only real hit that i desperately wanted to capture was this one at the end where everything goes black and then epic comes in that's the kind of that's the main thing that i wanted to hit um and so if we just play this section here <laughs> A 
everything's working up towards that moment of of black um i think in general i was trying to be as musical as possible and often i think people try and put in a little seven eight bar or whatever or do kind of little tempo shifts and things like that to try and make their music uh, fit the cuts um but i just wanted to try and make this as musical as possible and to make it quite dramatic as well i think um staying in the same kind of key signature the same time signature and the same tempo throughout just has this sense of momentum that just keeps building in layers um until ultimately the climax at the end there where it kind of suddenly falls off a cliff you you have quite a lot of uh drum tracks going on there um do you have any tips you can share dan of how to i guess mix those and program those uh when, when you kind of layer them up so you don't have like just flaming kind of effects etc yeah, I think in a lot of cases, sometimes it's about not quantizing too heavily so that you have the feeling of it being an ensemble playing rather than lots of MIDI notes playing at the same time. But as you can see in here, I'm trying not to uh, duplicate the kind of the rhythmic features too much. So um, where we've got these kind of big Albion XXL uh, percussion. Sometimes the layers only just have to be a couple of sounds, uh, one per bar. Whereas things that are maybe a little bit more percussive, like these dolls. I've been quite specific with the mic choices that I used so that we don't get too much of the room in there. So really pulling up the close microphones, trying to get the attack of the sound and sometimes turning up the tightness as well. So that even though on its own, it might feel a little bit unnatural, it just helps to kind of drive the pulse, drive the momentum a little bit better. And you, you compress, I can see there on the left. Yeah, so I, I tend to put all of my percussion into a track stack in this situation because a lot of the percussion was sort of hitting similar frequencies. I didn't split them up into low and high percussion. Um, in this case, I'm just using a bus compressor and at most I'm compressing about three to four dB, so not a huge amount really. Um, and then with EQ, really just rolling off some of the bottom end, I find that some of these lower frequencies really do tend to build up. I don't know if you guys find that as well in, in mm -hmm. other contexts, but um, particular frequencies around this kind of range, um, anywhere between a kind of 100 and 250 hertz is a particular kind of problem spot for building up frequencies. Maybe it's like a resonant room tone. I'm not sure. Totally. And I think like also leaving space, you know, for lower instruments to have those lower frequencies and cutting the high off them and then the higher ones, you know, doing, doing the opposite, really letting them shine in, in those frequencies. Absolutely, yeah. And I found often actually with the strings and the brass that I was trying not to use the high frequencies too much for that exact reason really, so that when you have things like this eDNA cutlery sound, which is quite quiet, but it's right at those very top frequencies. So I guess it's just about sort of staging things so that everything has its own place. Absolutely, yeah. So let's see how you, how you arrange the rest of or the other two libraries around this uh, quite busy percussion. So I started with the eDNA Earth here, just using, I mean, there are so many presets, over a thousand presets in this library, but um, you just sort of have to go through and find things that work for you. And I like things that are tonal, but have slightly weird kind of undulating tones around them. So I'm using this super tight with white noise. Which starts to kind of lay out the harmony a little bit. And then combined with that, you also have this light and friendly synth. which if we combine them with the low strings, uh, which I'm using here, the Albion legatos. It sort of blends together into a hybrid texture. And at least I find that for epic sounding music, often it's not just an orchestra, it's you know, a double bass with a cello an octave above, with a synth pad, with a sub bass underneath it. Um, it kind of sounds more synthy anyway, but I think that's kind of the point. So you've got this really epic melody. How much do you think a trailer is similar to like the credits of a film in terms of introducing the mood and sort of capturing that, you know, like a, a sort of microcosm of, of what you're going to see? That's a really interesting question. What do you think, Ollie? I think uh, opening credits are 
often I observe that they can be, I think they're different than trailers. Many times trailers are their own standing kind of piece of music because you have these like trailer houses, the right trailers, the right there needs, you only have like 30 seconds or a minute to really capture the audience. And it might, many times it's not always the, the, the sound of, of the whole film, right? Because the trailer has almost its own kind of um, task, its own, how do you say, its own purpose, right? So um, I think it's many times very different. And then the end credits, um, I think you you have a lot of like pop songs that are put on, on over the end credits or uh, here and there you have made the, the main themes um, from, from, the, from the film itself. But I really strongly believe that the trailer has its own kind of purpose. And that's why many times it's not the composer that writes the trailer music. It's, it's someone else that writes that kind of trailer music. But I do have to say in, in our task, it's kind of a mixture because we were given this trailer and the collection and the collection already sa uh, suggests kind of a mood or like a film that we have as, a, as inspiration, uh, which actually brings me to the next question, Dan. Did you have any... Uh, any kind of influences or inspirations for for this track, or w was there a tem track, or how did you go on about coming up with the with the overall sound of the of the trailer? So yeah, the temp track was really sort of hyped. The mix was really hyped. There was lots of kind of sound effects in the background of sort of what sounded like lasers almost. It was very kind of, you know, those really saturated um, soundtracks where there's just so much in every frequency. Um, it was kind of, it was very hard hitting. And I guess in, in trying to make it feel as dynamically diverse as possible, I wanted to make sure that the that the whole piece wasn't just like that. It sort of had a bit more of a build up, um, and certainly by the end. And I, I found this in in really every trailer that I've ever had to do as like a task like this. It's a case of just throwing as much at the wall as possible, and um, and sometimes it's about kind of layering multiple things together, like taking an octave legato and then combining it with you know the consordino legatos, um, just to make it have a slightly different blend to it. Um, and I found that that was definitely the case in the the temp score as well, which was sort of, I guess, influenced by uh, hybrid textures. Um, I think Tenet was quite a strong inspiration for for this temp. How do you, how do you? keep your own voice while fulfilling a task or what I said, a purpose of a trailer? Uh, do you have little tricks or in this case, uh, maybe like layering sounds that you achieve uh, textures that you kind of always use or little tricks that you always use? Yeah, absolutely. Well, to be honest, for me, writing hybrid textures, combining eDNA Earth with Albion One was quite natural for me anyway. I quite like kind of combining those hybrid textures, but also in particular parts where there might be a G minor chord, I might add a sixth or a ninth into there. I quite like jazz harmony and, and sometimes just incorporating little moments into that. But also, as far as the story is concerned, sometimes that helps just to bring out the emotion a little bit. And even though this hypothetical trailer might be for a film that is sort of for the most part is set in space but maybe has a kind of emotional maybe slightly romantic um, tendency to it as well it's sort of bringing out the harmony that uh, helps to kind of evoke that emotion so what about your main melody are you doubling it because what i really like about this score is that the strings are super high and then you've got that really polarized bassy um, percussion layer um, so, so what are you actually scoring that with? Yeah, so in general, I'm using a combination of the brass high octaves and the strings high octaves as well, combining the unmuted and then the consordino strings. If I just solo these parts on their own. But to make it even more raspy, I've actually taken the brass and added a distortion plugin, which is only driving by like one dB, but I feel it helps to bring out the kind of fortissimo, which I think is probably quite evocative of uh, of this epic style in general, with that kind of overblown brassy sound. Really amazing stuff, then. Would you like to play the whole trailer one more time for us, please? Sure.
Amazing. Thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, Lucy, would you like to take us through the Zeitgeist collection and show us what you've done with the trailer? Sure. So Zeitgeist is really about emotion, um, raw emotion, really. Um, but I think set in a contemporary sort of minimal way. Um, so the Zeitgeist collection includes Albie and Neo, um, the Olafur Arnold Stratus and the Kepler Orchestra which are really gorgeous ambient tools to work with. And the trailer I was given uh, was about the journey of someone becoming a boxer and about passion and family and overcoming issues. But definitely the most important element was that sort of emotional overtone um, within the images. And um, zeitgeist actually means the spirit or mood of an era and definitely this trailer is all about spirit and channeling these subtle and nuanced um, fleeting emotional colors so yeah let's hear it Love it. That's great. Thank you. I particularly like all those rhythmic features in there as well. Is that something that you consciously added uh, or is that sort of part of the Zeitgeist collection in its sound world? Both, I think, definitely. I mean, you know, there's obviously that the story of the boxer and the movement and the sort of physicality of the images and the way um, the sequence unfolds. But I think... Yeah, certainly Stratus and Kepler, there's loads of movement going on there in those instruments. Um, and I started with Stratus, actually. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll play you what I started with, essentially, um, which is this Stratus, um, these Stratus chords, essentially. Yeah, so that acted as a sort of backbone um, for me to build on. That sounds amazing. Did you did you take any of Oliver Arnold's music as as inspiration, or any any particular film, or uh, how did you how did you decide to start with this element? Yeah, I mean, I I love listening to Oliver's stuff, and um, definitely you know inspired by his work. I think other artists relevant to this collection are people like Johan Johansson, even some of Hilde Gudendotter's stuff, um, and people like Niels Fram and uh, Max Richter. And um, yeah, I think there's there's quite a wealth of rich compositions that are in this style. Um, so yeah, I think I was taking inspiration from them in terms of like very effective, like minimal quality and um, subtle ways of layering things. Mm. Do you find that with uh, zeitgeist type genres that it's a lot of layering of soft sounds or um, or is that just the kind of the style that you like to work in? Um, yeah, I think zeitgeist like is about being minimal, being a little bit cool, being, you know, n not necessarily over egging the pudding um, for want of a better expression. Yeah, I think it's really, again, about letting the images speak. And I think definitely as the, the sequence unfolds, we get a more emotional, rich um, sound world unfolding, which I've sort of used the Kepler for, actually. Um, so we've got the woodwind grid, which is doing these pulses. Let me play you those. So Kepler is sort of a strange one because I, I feel... Like, there's so many possibilities with Kepler. You can have, you know, these very complex um, organic um, interactions between your voices, but then you can also do quite simple um, pulsations and shards and things. I 
love this one, but I also really love Sahara, which again has this, um, it's got the woods really blow. It's actually got saxophones, so really rich um, sound uh, paired with flautando. So like really cool how it undulates between the two. Do you think the softness kind of helps to bring out the intimacy in the story? Yeah, I think intimacy is really important in this. We've, we've got a lot of um, very intimate shots, like in the bedroom, in the boxing ring. Um, and yeah, I think intimacy can be a lot more powerful in, in some respects than massive orchestras um, having really close articulations and, and feeling a lot closer to the player. And I don't know about you, but... When, I, when I'm in a concert listening to a soloist, I'm much more on the edge of my seat. I, I feel like, you know, empathy for them and I'm, I'm wondering what's going to happen. Yeah, you definitely hear the expressiveness that one player kind of brings out as opposed to a whole section of players. And maybe that's why using a slightly more, a slightly smaller ensemble like Olaf tends to use in his music, maybe that's what kind of lends itself to that slightly more kind of minimalist, intimate sound. Some other intimate musical ideas, so I've got this heartbeat pulse going on. As I said, I wanted the rhythm to kind of flow throughout and at some point after the hit, the sounds drop out and we're, we're left with a more exposed um, texture and, and a, a heartbeat sound. Actually, it's, it's um, a kick drum from the Brunel loops, but this is the, the sound. So, Lucy, I can see that you've used quite a lot of audio. You've bounced uh, MIDI in place. Why, why did you do that? Yeah, um, it's something I really like to do, actually. Um, I sort of like to have a little bit more control sometimes over the MIDI. So usually I just bounce in place, you know, right-click, bounce in place. And then, you know, you have the opportunity to really sculpt the sound more to chop it up and change it, add effects, you know. And, and sometimes, especially with loops, you find really nice little bits that you, you'd like to extend or include or, um, yeah. Mm, lovely. Thanks a lot. Uh, would you like to play the whole trailer one more time, please? Sure. So, Ollie, how about Independent? I'm really excited for this one. Yeah, so the Independent collection is actually very exciting. It's, it's, it's right up my street. It's a Bernard Herrmann toolkit, Oliver Arnold's toolkit, and Orchestral Swarm. And so it's all about being a pioneer in your film. So Bernard Herrmann, I don't need to say too much. It's, you know, Alfred Hitchcock and all these films. And I think the way he's recorded the, the, the combinations within the orchestra and, and instrumentation he's used is very unique and, and was very new and bold at the time. And the same was, is with Oliver Arnold's, you know, he's, he's right on the forefront with his kind of felted piano movement together with perhaps Niels Fram. And it's, it's a very new sound that he's, that he's come up with. And then we have the orchestral swarm, which is a wonderful co collaboration between Spitfire and Bleeding Fingers. And Bleeding Fingers, of course, being Hans Zimmer's company is also um, a company or, or a production kind of a uh, group of uh, people who write music that is on the forefront of uh, creating film music. Um, so I was very excited to create to create a piece with it. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to play it down for you.
my trailer has played. If you guys want to say how like amazing it is and ask questions. No notes. <laughs> that was so cool, Oliver. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, okay, come on. Yeah, I wonder how you start something like that because it didn't seem overloaded with stuff. I imagine with sound effects, there are going to be kind of wind noises, maybe bird song, things like that. How do you, how do you start something like that that feels open and gives, gives space to the sounds? Uh, for me, the hard piece uh, was definitely the piano. And I guess being a pianist, I usually start a composition with a piano because I lay it out. But having this felt grand piano at my disposal which is in Oliver Arnold's toolkit library. I think this already when you play it, it gives you this kind of like feeling that you, that you need to be spacious with it. Um, I've just played a couple of notes here. So like it has this really, really wonderful uh, tail that is just enormous here um, labeled SP, which is splosh. So yeah, I can turn that even, even more up. And it just, for me, that that already just set the scene of like this this forest that that we have here in in the opening shots. And I just basically continued scoring the whole uh, this whole trailer with with this setting. And and that for me kind of just sets the mood of it. And I'm not using a lot of notes. Um, I just I've, I saved my first draft here that I just basically improvised with it. Improvised, I guess there was a temp track um, and it was just kind of two chords back and forth with, with a lot of piano as well. So I mirrored that a little bit. Um, but other than that, or I took the tempo from it as well. But other than that, I kind of improvised with this, um, just with this wonderful piano. And I'm just going to play this for you since it's, it's the heart piece. Uh, I hope you don't mind. And for me personally, this is, you know, I mean, n now we, we've heard a lot of felt piano and a lot of music on a lot of uh, trailers on, on everything really that's out there. But I think a few years back, maybe five years or, or perhaps 10 years, you know, they, this would have been a really bold kind of move to have a piano with like a, a felted effect, a muffled effect on it with a, with a really lush, long reverb. And to me, this already kind of works, works really well with these, with these images and this kind of magic realism kind of kind of genre is it difficult for you as a pianist to avoid putting a piano into a score at least for me i often end up putting something in even like if you say it's just a subtle thing but there's something really nice about being able to kind of sketch out your ideas and then that becomes part of the final piece i think so too like it just because you connect and that that's what lucy said before if it's if it's an intimate instrument or one single instrument you really connect with the emotion of the story and the picture and i think that's what happens when you sketch out things right you you're just really there your heart is there you like you you kind of become one with the story and 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 play it on, on your instrument that you express yourself and then in the end getting rid of it feels like you're getting rid rid of the essence of the of the piece that you've written you know and so for me, this, yeah, it just had to stay there, you know, not obviously I, I wanted to use it also because it's part of the collection, but I just, I just had to keep it. The only thing I did, I've moved my point here of, of it being a bit more emotional of uh, lifting it up here because I then pretty much after added this mixed flute kind of swell here. And, and that's more of like a Mickey Mousing the picture, but I just thought it, it, it fits so well. This is from uh, the Bernard Herman library, by the way. Uh, which it was tricky because the Bernard Herrmann library is is recorded in in Air Studio in Studio One, so a slightly drier space, and it's it's more up front. And you can see here I've chosen um, the ambient and the outrigger and mic, and have quite a lot of reverb on there to be able to match it with this uh, really 
um, reverberant piano. But to get back to the story, um, I was using this, um, yeah, this kind of flute effect. And it's kind of this wood, that's the moment where the woodman kind of uh, uh, rises and he's kind of like jumping up and kind of uh, leaves fall around and the, and, and the leaves are kind of sh shaking in the wind. And for me, it just kind of uh, fitted so well. So basically, that's why I've moved this um, more upbeat uh, moment uh, here. But I even kept this, uh, this exact take that I did the first time. And it's rhythmically uh, just a tiny bit wonky, but I didn't want to touch it up and, and, and put it on the grid. So, so yeah, I, ju I just kept it. I love that moment when we see the walking tree, like that flurry you do. I think it's really magic. And I think there's that, that sort of strange, like um, sort of uncanny, like, childlike and yet sort of dark thing going on and do you think these these um, particular libraries are well suited in that respect i mean the bernard herman's quite dark in in some respects yeah i think these they're actually the perfect libraries because you have two aspects so the as you say the bernard herman library is quite dark and harsh and up front and you can do with the strings and and these combinations of uh, different things uh, different things. I'm saying, I want to say different uh, orchestral instrument, like, um, for example, uh, low strings and uh, trombones. Yeah, you can have um, you can have it mixed up. You can have the flutes mixed up, harp and celeste, and then you have this uh, really amazing synth collection, which is actually a bit of a, a hidden kind of weapon because you don't get it here in the main menu. You have to go advanced and then synths, and it has a bunch of. Uh, amazing synth and that's for me a little bit dark aspect so as well here i'm using this raucous sweller which is i love this synth turn it up a little bit and for me that's a, more of a dark sound so when you hear when you see the tree man the first time here so I'm putting this sound in there. I have a couple of effects on there, a sample delay to, to achieve the Haas effect, uh, then a bit of distortion, um, just taking out the low ends because I didn't want to have a bass effect. I have a different bass, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and this, the Bernard Herrmann, yes, it's true. It's a little bit the darker sound. And then you have the, the ambient stuff in the Oliver Arnold's toolkit. For me, that sets where the whole scene is. It's light, it's... Again, it's these shots we have here in the beginning, uh, kind of mountains, forest, nature, and you have these light atmospheres, like, for example, this Evo ambience here. Something that's called dream sequence. Very wonderful, and, and the, the, the sound quality is, is really the opposite of Bernard Herrmann, yet it's kind of bold and... and um, uh, not risky, but yeah, they're they're pioneers in their field, so so it's uh, really out there these sounds, uh, but on 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 separate ends of the spectrum. And then something else uh, we have in here is the orchestral swarm, and that one I've used to do a little bit more Mickey Mousing in that sense. I'm like coloring in different sequences of the story here. For example, uh, the water. I guess. It would have been different maybe if there would have been sound effects on there, but the director did tell me that sound effects are only going to be very minimal. So I, I allowed myself to score these moments such, such as the water here uh, with these horns, for example. So it's kind of dripping water. And then here with the, the, these high pit swarms, which makes it more obvious that it's uh, kind of dripping or... Uh, flowing water. I don't only have it where the water comes to make to not make it too obvious, but it, it swells up a little bit where, where, where we see the river. And then one of my favorite ever patches is, are these woods high. And they're, I think they go kind of hand in hand with this Evo ambience here. If we have a quick listen. And if you look at the sun, um, I mean, I have to admit, it's a little bit coincidence, but you can hear these like uh, 
it's, it's air and then a note comes through here and there. And it's like the sun sh shining through the trees where you have the sunbeams coming through here and there and it just fits so wonderfully. And if I layer it up with the am uh, Evo ambience, uh, you see what I mean by, you know, it's a similar characteristics. And then I've added some other woods high, uh, some mordant kind of swarms. And that's for me the, the childlike effect. It's almost like birds or butterflies kind of like, or, or little, little bucks, you know, jumping around in the, in, in the forest. So a very, very suitable sounds for me there. Does that answer your question, Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a bit of a long-winded question, but yeah, here we go. <laughs> no, that's so good, Ollie. I mean, that's just like, you smashed it. I'm quite curious about your influences on this one, Oliver. Yeah, so I had um, a couple of influences or a few influences with a couple of strong ones. Uh, one was uh, Midsummer. Uh, there's a track in there which I got influenced by kind of the harmonic movement of the strings, which I haven't talked about. Um, so maybe the strings I can just touch up on just, just a moment. Um, it's really lovely to write with the Bernard Herman strings, I have to say, because they have just such a strong and bold tone. I, I know I keep saying bold, but it's just a, a really good, lively is another good word. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's just have a listen to the to the string arrangement here. Very, very simple, but I think it just needed something there. Once the woodman is up and going, it's kind of, you know, the track and the trailer um, pick up the pace. So I really tried to do two things with this, um, or maybe three things. So here with this one, I just tried to um, keep the tension high um, together with um, the kind of uh, pizzicato swarm here. Uh, it's just a major trill. All the way through, and then the strings... Uh, I guess the second violins that would be, uh, they kind of repeat the melody of the of the main piano, so my my main melody. And then on the low strings, I try to be a little bit ominous. So the story for me is yes, it's all happy, but it's it's still a bit mysterious and kind of strange, this this woodman or this tree man kind of walking in, into, into a house. So that's kind of the, the underlying um, kind of danger in a way. Not really in a horror way danger, but just kind of respect danger. And then it turns into kind of a, then I want to go back into the trailer and be like kind of um, hopeful in a way. Um, and so that kind of marries up there. Um, and then my other influence um, was kind of the, the John Bryan uh, scores, um, kind of uh, punch drunk love uh, direction. And I've done, I guess the percussion could potentially come up a little bit, but I've added this, this kind of beat or groove in a way. So it's kind of going with the steps of the of of the woodman, and I like in John Bryan's uh, scores how he how he uses percussion always quite upfront, and and also very dry sounding sounding strings. Uh, so these two influences were quite quite prominent. Uh, I have some other influences that I just listened and added to my playlist, which by the way you guys can click in the in the description, uh, which was Cajillionaire. Um, Ladybirds, um, Minari, and then just some other Thomas Paul Thomas Anderson films such as There Will Be Blood or uh, Phantom Thread. Uh, these are kind of yeah the most influential scores 
uh, for, for, for this spe specific score. And how important do you think sound design is now in independent films? I mean, a lot of independent films you see now are almost um, someone, you know, you could say almost entirely noise based or um, really experimental. And yeah, what, what do you think of this sort of direction that um, independent films seem to be going in this sort of trend um, i i love it and i think the sound effects are very very important to to make the connection to the to the movie because you know with without dialogue and just the music and the picture i think it's it's hard to to really f like you can feel things but to really be there um you know, like especially in the, in this last shot, you know, it would be amazing to perhaps hear some footsteps or hear like the, you know, the shaking of the of the leaves or when you when you're in the forest, you know, certainly the water would be amazing or the, you know, yeah, again the, the kind of the noises of the forest, you know, stuff like that. I think it's 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 very important. Well, it's sort of an art film, isn't it? And I guess in a way, before before I kind of saw more about your project, I thought there were actually sound effects in there, but I think it was just a lot of those kind of woodwind sounds, those slightly kind of softly blown air through the flutes and things like that. It, it kind of lends itself to the sounds of, uh, it's sort of word painting really, isn't it? I Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And it's probably what I tried to overcompensate a little bit by putting these little bits in there that you just, just mentioned because there weren't any sound uh, uh, effects. Um, but yeah, I think it's also beautiful that as as a composer you have all this, all this freedom, all this canvas to to paint on, rather than everything is full and you have to kind of balance around all the all the sound effects. But yeah, I think there's going to be sound effects on this one, so I'm I'm really curious and excited to see how it's going to turn out uh, in the end. And yeah, I feel like with this particular series of images, it could go in so many different ways. And as the composer, you've got a huge responsibility actually to tell more that story or that direction because in this case it's actually quite hard to tell you know how potentially gruesome it might be or how magical um yeah it's true yeah i was there was a moment where i thought you know especially using the bernard herman toolkit should i go horror you know it would have been really easy to 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 do that i think especially with yeah with, with this library and and then just using perhaps some ambient sounds from from the Oliver Arnold's toolkits and yeah a bit of decoration of the swarm and, and really carry it with the Bernard Herrmann um, uh, library and, and make it horror or scary but I just I just never really felt that this this woodman is scary it just looks quite sweet to me it's it's like you want to give him a hug and be picked up and you know <laughs> Might be a wood woman. Or wood woman, yeah, okay, f fair enough, could also be, yeah. Um, but uh, maybe it's also just, I uh, I don't know, I like forests and, you know, grew up close by and for me they're, they're really nice. It's a nice environment and it's always beautiful and, yeah, that, that's what came out and we didn't have much much of a guidance in terms of, of brief, you know, um, other than... Uh, telling a story of, of what could possibly be. Guys, I've just realized I've got Woodman on my desk. <laughs> Have you seen this? <laughs> <gasps> Creepy. <laughs> Ollie, what would you say kind of distinguishes the genres of independent versus zeitgeist? If you want, I mean, I, I, I have it clear, you know, what the independent collection is, is is much more you can you can make bolder decisions and be more upfront. I think the zeitgeist score is is more plays into the role and into the storyline. I think that's great. Can we have a listen to it the whole way through? Yes, absolutely.
Before we round up, does anyone have a favourite of the nine libraries we've seen today? Um, if you could only have one of the nine. I'd probably go for the Oliver Arnold's toolkit simply because of the piano. Because I would use I'd use it I'd use it all the time, even to sketch stuff. And then you have kind of beautiful textures and you have some cool rhythms in there as well. Synth rhythms. You'd go you'd go a long way, I think, with that library. I don't know. I feel like it's a bit of a cheat to say Albion One because it has got everything in it. But I Bernard Herman was actually the first library I ever bought from Spitfire, so that might have to be my choice. That's also really cool. That's also a good choice. What about you, Lucy? Hmm, I don't know, you know. I I love Stratus. Can I pick more than one? <laughs> I love Stratus. I love the synths in Stratus. I really love the synth sounds, like the warp sounds. I love dusty tape. I think that's like my my favorite um, actual patch. But I also really like Hans Zimmer's um, percussion. Uh, that's sort of my guilty pleasure. Um, yeah. So I don't know. <sighs> hmm. Too much choice. <laughs> yeah. Right, that's it. Thank you very much, Dan Keen and Lucy Treacher. It was a pleasure having you on the Composer Roundtable. Thanks a lot for letting us peek into your processes and compositions. And thank you guys for listening and watching. If you have any questions, please let us know in the comment section below or head over to our website and uh, click on the forums tab where you can join loads of interesting conversations. The spring sale lasts from the 24th of May until the 30th of May and you can save 40% on individual products and over 65% with our collections. That's it for now. I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.